So, now we are going to discuss combing mechanisms. Now, you can see that in this slide, the constructional view of a comber is shown. And what we see here is that the, these two are laps. This is a reserve lap and this one is a lap which is going to be fed and on which the combing operation will be carried out. So, one lap will be always kept in reserve and the other lap will be in working position. Now, if I see it here, the lap is resting on two rollers, they are called lap rollers and from these lap rollers, the lap is unwound, the sheet is being shown by this brown color line and then it passes over a small eccentric which you see it here and then from the eccentric it goes downwards, then here there is a feed roller. If I look at this diagram, it will be clear, the feed roller is here. So, from this feed roller, the lap sheet is going to be fed and as the sheet is being fed, then the sheet is going to be gripped by a pair of plate which we call leaper plate, which we have already discussed in the, the previous lecture. Once the leaper plates close down, they grip the sheet firmly and now the cylinder comb that is which is here, this cylinder comb is going to act on the sheet of fibers. So, there are needles as you know on the cylinder comb and these needles is they are going to penetrate the fringe which is projecting out from the grip of the lever plate and this fringe will be acted upon by the needles of the cylinder comb. As a result, the loose fibers or short fibers will be taken out. The mechanism we have already or the principle we have already discussed in the previous um, uh, lecture. So, once this comb fringe is combed, the nipper assembly as a whole that is this assembly as a whole is going to move forward and will bring the will bring the sheet in under the grip like the sheet will go and will be under the grip of the detaching rollers. So, the detaching roller will be now move forward and it will try to pull the fringe which has been combed. So, as it is pulled forward, the fringe is taken out, but by that time we have to make sure that when the fringe is being pulled, the nippers are not going to grip the sheet, otherwise the fibers will be pulled and as a result fibers might break. So, by the time the detaching rollers start acting on the fringe, the nipper plates they move apart from each other, as a result they are not going to be grit. So, as part of the fibers which are being withdrawn, their trailing end may still lie in the uncombed part of the lap sheet. This is what is going to happen and uh, now we are going to, this is a broad you know, description of the way the machine is going to work. One more point which I want to mention, there is a cylinder comb which you see the needles which are here, these needles get filled up with lot of fibers and lot of you know, impurities. So, we need to clean them and hence we have a brush at the bottom, the brush is going to continuously clean. The, the needles which are there on the cylinder. Now, this is the broad you know, description of the process. Now, we will take up the various mechanisms which are there that we want to know how the different elements are going to work and what is the mechanism behind them. Let us go to the next slide. So, now, so we have seen that the various you know organs of the machines, they have to work together and uh, we will try to understand that how these 
what are the various mechanisms which are there which make these different organs or different elements of the machines to move. So, if you study the Combe mechanism, the first point is that a constant rotational motion is generated in a central shaft on which the cylinder combs are mounted. So, first of all from a motor we have to give a drive to a shaft on which the cylinder combs which are generally 18 numbers are all mounted. So, a rotational motion is first generated in a central shaft. Now, the Nippert shaft there is another shaft which is made to turn in a clockwise and anticlockwise directions by crank mechanism in each revolution of the central shaft. So, from the central shaft we drive another shaft that is called Nipper shaft and this shaft is made to turn in a it is basically it oscillates in a clockwise and anticlockwise directions and the mechanism we are going to discuss very soon that the mechanism is basically a crank mechanism. So, the rocking motion that we generate in the Nipper shaft is translated into oscillating movement of the Nipper assembly. We will see the Nipper assembly and see how this uh, rocking motion is translated into an oscillating movement of the Nipper assembly. That is the Nipper assembly as a whole is made to move forward and backward. So, how, how it is going to happen? The other thing is the oscillating movement of the Nipper assembly is used to feed the lap, to grip the sheet as a lap sheet and to make the top comb descend. That is they will actually move downwards and will penetrate the fringe. So, the oscillating movement of the assembly is then used for doing all these things, feeding the lap sheet, gripping the sheet and also making the top comb to descend on the comb fringe. So, the first thing is that we generate a rotational movement in the central shaft. So, that movement is easy to generate. What we need is basically a motor and therefore, motor we give drive to another pulley and the pulley is mounted on a central shaft. So, rotational movement is generated in the central shaft. And let us say here exists that this point is the location of the central shaft. Now, on this what we have is that there is a mechanism called crank mechanism and in this crank mechanism there is a crank arm, here there is a shaft we call it nipper shaft. So, the arm is here as shown and the arm passes through a slider, the slider is shown here by the rectangular box and the slider is mounted on a circular disc we call it crank wheel. So, this is the crank wheel. So, slider is actually mounted on the crank wheel and the crank wheel in turn is mounted on the central shaft. So, now as the crank wheel rotates what will happen that this crank arm will go down in this direction and also move up in this direction. A result of that the other end of the crank arm which is actually connected to the nipper shaft will cause the nipper shaft to oscillate. So, as the crank wheel rotates the slider arm will keep moving from top position to the bottom position and to forward mode position to backward position. This is if it rotates in a anti clockwise directions. So, as a result the shaft this crank shaft is going to move up and down and as the movement of up and down the other end of the shaft which is connected to the nipper will cause the nipper shaft to turn by an angle beta as shown here and the 
the slider is there, the, this clank arm is passes through a hole in the slider and what happens that as the slider changes its position, the crank arm, the slider can turn or tilt a bit so that there is not much force which is acting on the crank arm. So, it can adjust itself because the connection between the slider and the cramper is through a pin joint type, this type of pin joint and hence the slider can easily tilt or turn depending upon its location and as a result the crank arm can easily move up and down. So, if you look at the geometry of this, then we can write that this angular movement beta, the sine beta is going to be O b by N b, where O b is how much? O b is basically the radius of the circle on which the slider is mounted or you can say the distance of the slider from the center of the shaft that is what is O b which is equal to capital R and it also depends rather factor rather you know, factor that comes to the picture is N b where N and b this is the length of the crank arm. Now, you understand that the length of the camper actually keeps on changing. The arm length is different at different locations. At this location, the arm length is whatever is length x. When it is here, the length increases and when it is again comes up somewhere in the front position, the length decreases. So, that means the length x which is n b we have written it is not constant, it changes. x can vary from between l, l is the minimum distance between the slider and the neighbor shaft and the, if the radius of this slider, the circle which is representing the location of the slider is r, then the maximum distance is going to be l plus 2 r. Therefore, the value of x is not really constant and keeps on changing. <coughs> so, beta value depends upon O b by N b, the maximum if I take the in these two extreme positions either the top or the bottom, the value of N b is going to be same and we can find out what is the maximum value of the angle that is going to form that is beta and we can say that depends upon R and the value x itself. So, as a result the Nipper shaft keeps on oscillating. Now, in this diagram what we see here that the Nipper shaft center and the center of the crank wheel they are at the same plane. Now, we come to the oscillation of the Nipper assembly. Let us look at this diagram first. In this diagram here this is the Nipper shaft. On the Nipper shaft there is a swing arm and there is another nipper plate called bottom nipper plate. This is connected to this and this is pivoted here. The other end of the plate if you look at it is supported by the cylinder comb axis. So, lower nipper plate is supported at the front that is this plate by two pivot levers. So, these are the pivot levers at the front on the cylinder comb axis. So, this is the cylinder comb axis or you can say the cylinder the, the uh, central shaft on which all the combing cylinders are mounted. And at the back by the swing arms screwed in the nipper shaft and rotatable at the pivot axis. So, this is why it is pivoted here and then it is going like this. Here it is also pivoted and connected to the cylinder comb axis. This is how the links are interconnected. Now, the nipper shaft that is this shaft as you know that we make it to oscillate in the forward and backward directions. So, nipper assembly is accelerated or decelerated twice per nipper cycle. So, which could be roughly 6 times per second, we can work it out it may be little more or little less all depends upon the, the speed of the machine. Angular oscillations of the nipper shaft causes the assembly to move backward and forward. 
Now, if this Lippert shaft keeps turning in the forward and backward direction, a result of this, this whole assembly will move forward and backward. So, this forward and backward movement of the assembly as a whole is very important. We will see why do you need this kind of movement that we will try, we will understand later on. That another thing is this bottom nipper plate is connected to top nipper plate, or you can say top nipper plate is connected to bottom nipper plate, and there is a spring in between them which is not shown here. And as the plate moves forward, the top nipper plate will open, and as it moves backward, the top nipper plate will actually move down. So, we will see this in some slides which is going to come soon. So, the idea is that the nipper shaft is always oscillating and result of that the nipper assembly consisting of bottom nipper plate, top nipper plate and there will be a top comb which is not shown here, entire assembly keeps moving forward and backward. We come to this thing that is the mechanism of lap feed. How do you feed the lap? We have seen already that the lap actually rests on two lap rollers which moves continuously and as a result of that the lap is unrolled and the lap is made to move over an eccentric and then it moves downward. If you see the path, it moves downward and then goes under the feed plate. Now, the feed plate we turn, but we do not turn the feed plate continuously. The feed plate is made to rotate by one tith per revolution of the cylinder. And the mechanism of movement of the feed roller, which is feeding the lap sheet is shown here. So, this is the diagram for the forward feed and this is the diagram for the backward feed. Then there are two types of feeding of the lap sheet. We will learn about them that I can feed the lap sheet when the nipper assembly is moving forward and we can also feed the lap sheet when the nipper assembly is moving backward. So, depending upon this timing of the feed, we call it forward feed machine or backward feed machine. So, in the forward feed, feeding takes place when the nipper moves forward and the backward feed, feeding takes place when the nipper swing backward. And the mechanism is that there is a ratchet and pawl which is used for turning the feed roller. A pawl is secured to the top nipper, pulls the ratchet by one tooth when it is opening or closing. See, this pole is connected to the top nipper plate as shown here. So, as the nipper plate assembly moves forward, the top nipper plates which are there, they actually move apart from each other. And as a result, the pole is going to pull this teeth of the ratchet. So, for every cycle, it will pull the teeth or by, by simply by one. So, one teeth or one tooth will be pulled and as a result of that the ratchet is connected to the feed roller, the feed roller will rotate. So, if we have suppose we have in the ratchet 18 teeth typically if I say an example, then if I every cycle will we pull the tooth, we only pull one tooth and therefore, the ratchet will turn by 1 18th revolutions and the ratchet is connected to the feed roller and the feed roller will also turn by 118 revolutions. So, the way it has been designed is that the pole is going to always pull one tooth per cycle and as a result the feed roller is going to turn by 118th. If the teeth is 20th, then it would be 120th, it is like that. 
The other thing is that when you want to feed in the backward, when the assembly is moving in backward directions, then you see the pole has changed its positions. So, then we have this kind of arrangement and here this pole is going to then push the teeth in this direction for every revolution of the cylinder or the main shaft as the nipper is oscillating forward and backward. And as a result of that, so when the bottom nipper plate moves in the backward direction, this arrow shows this will be pushed. As a result, the ratchet is going to turn by only one tooth. So, we, what we see, difference which I see is that the location of the pole is different. In one case it is here, in the other case it is here. In one case, this pole acts on the ratchet when it moves forward, the assembly moves forward. In the other case, the pole is going to act on the ratchet when the nipper plate moves backward. The result is one tooth movement of the ratchet and the ratchet is connected to the feed roller. So, feed roller will turn by one whatever is number of teeth 1 18th or 1 20th and if I know the diameter of the feed roller we can find out because of one tooth movement how much lap sheet is going to be fed and typically the lap feed is 4.3 to 6.7 millimeter per cycle. So, by moving the tooth of the ratchet by 1, we can ultimately feed the lap sheet by 4.3 to 6.7 millimeter per cycle. If we go to this lap feeding in little details now, that the lap is going to be unrolled as it is shown here. It is passing over the eccentric shaft, it has been already mentioned earlier and then it is going downwards. Here is the feed roller and feed roller as I said it turns intermittently. So, every revolution makes the roller turns only by fraction of a revolution. So, if you look at the path of the lap sheet, we see that from here to there whatever is the path length, this path length is going to change if the nipper plate moves forward. Suppose nipper plate has moved to this, it has moved somewhere here. In that case, the field ruler position is going to be not here, it will also sit from here to there. As a result, the path length of the lap sheet is going to change. So, what is the influence of this? The lap is going to be stretched, the lap is very, very weak. So, if I do not compensate the change in path length because of oscillation of the nipper, then the lap is going to be uh, stretched unduly and as a result we may find that the comb slide is going to be very, very uneven. So, to take care of this particular aspect is change in path length, what we have the distance between the fluted roller, these two are fluted rollers and feed roller increases and decreases with 2 and 4 movement of the nipper assembly as I told you already. And to take care of this or to compensate this we have eccentric shaft. Eccentric shaft placed in the path rotates intermittently in a clockwise and anti clockwise directions to compensate the path length change and it ensures an even tension in the lap sheet. So, whenever I need extra excess length, this particular eccentric will move forward and excess length will be provided, so that the sheet is not going to be stressed or there should not be undue tension which is going to cause little bit of slippage between fibers in the lap sheet. That is what we want to avoid and therefore, this is very important to know ki how much the feed roller is going to move and the result of this, what is going to be the change in the path length. So, if the path length change is x, that x needs to be then compensated by this eccentric. So, eccentric is basically a roller which is eccentrically mounted 
and depending upon its radius, if it turns, excess length will be fed or excess length will act will be fed and thereby the tension can be adjusted. That is the purpose of the eccentric shaft that we have here. The next thing is that as we discussed that as the nipper moves forward or it moves backward that is what is going to happen continuously and that is being done by the oscillating movement or rocking motion of the nipper shaft. So, which is also shown here this is the nipper shaft and this is the link this is another link this is another link. So, it is basically a kind of four bar linkage mechanism we will study how opening and closing of the nippers is going to take place. Top nipper plate is movably mounted on bottom nipper plate. So, bottom nipper plate is this one and top nipper plate is shown here and they are actually connected through a pivot. So, that they can move and they can move apart from each other we will see how it is done. The top nipper plate is movably mounted on the bottom nipper plate and is also suspended from a shaft by a spring. This plate is the whole plate top from here to there the top nipper plate is suspended from this shaft and there is a spring connection between them. As the assembly is moved forward the top nipper plate is raised due to different leverage of the lever mechanism. So, as it moves forward the different length of the lever mechanism the nipper top nipper plate will move upward and as the assembly is withdrawn that when it is going in the backward directions like shown in the next diagram the spring pressure the spring will press the top nipper against the bottom nipper and will grip the lap sheet. So, when it is moving backward this is going to close down and the spring is going to apply some pressure. So, that the sheet is the sheet is going to be gripped. Generally the combing occurs when the nipper plate is going backward directions. So, if that is the time when the combing takes place then before the combing starts we have to close the nipper. So, that the lap is gripped. So, in the backward journey of the nipper plate the, the, the top and bottom nipper plates will be in closed configurations and the spring is going to apply pressure so that the lab is gripped properly and then this will move backward. Okay. So, the movement or the rocking motion of the nipper shaft in the clockwise and the anticlockwise direction will cause the nipper plates to open and to close. So, it will not only <coughs> move backward and forward the top and bottom nipper plate is also opening and closing simultaneously. So, by this mechanism which is called link mechanism we fulfill two objectives one is we make the bottom nipper plate or the assembly as a whole to move forward and backward at the same time the top and bottom nipper plate also open and closes this is also going to happen simultaneously. Next is about the cylinder comb. Now, the cylinder comb is basically a cylinder which is mounted on the main shaft which we have discussed earlier and the main shaft gets a constant rotation. So, the cylinder shaft extends through the whole of the machine the combing cylinder supports a combing segment that is this is called the combing segment which is also known as half lap which is screwed to the cylinder surface and the half lap contains metallic teeth. So, these are the teeth on the half lap. These teeth could be of two types one is short tooth type as shown on the left hand side diagram and it could be look like a needles as shown in the right hand side diagram. So, short tooth type clothing is very robust they are basically very strong and they need less maintenance whereas the needle types <coughs> are usually little weak <coughs> needles are weak in comparison to the short 
truth, but both of them are available. So, if you have too much of you know, trash particles in the lab, then it is better to use the short tooth type of clothing, which is robust. And if you want to really process very fine fibers where trash particles are less, then we want, we generally prefer in that case the needle type of teeth. Your needle type of teeth are actually, in a way, they are, they do not you know, create too much of stress on the fibers also, because we have to also make sure that the fibers will not get damaged while I am trying to comb the fringe. We have to protect the fibers also. Short tooth type is basically a little bit aggressive on the fibers. So, the fibers are short and strong generally, in that case short tooth type can be used, whereas the needle types will be preferred when we go for very delicate fine fibers, where which are not very strong. So, in that case we will prefer needle type. Point density generally increases. So, what we see here the cross sectional view, where there are large number of needles. I can show you typically a half lap here, you look at which I am holding right now. This is a typical half lap. You see, there is an arc. On the arc, these needles are all mounted, and there are large number of rows. If you look it carefully, the needles are actually all inclined. So there are many rows. The rows could be 18 or even 23. It may vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. So many rows are there, and these needles are inclined at a particular angle, and they are very closely spaced. So this is what is then fixed on the cylinder and then screwed onto it. This is what is half lap needles, which you can see here. Okay, I leave it now in this place. So, this is all about the cylinder comb. Otherwise, the mechanism to turn it is very simple that is for motor pulley, the motion goes to the central shaft and there is another pulley there. So, the motion is transmitted from the motor pulley to the central shaft. As the central sub rotates, the cylinders also rotate because cylinder sub extends from one end to other end of the machines, and all the cylinders are mounted on it. The density of the needles varies from first row to the last row. The reason is gradual increase in the intensity of the combing. That is, we do not want to be very aggressive right from the beginning, when the first row of the needles or the teeth is going to penetrate the fringe, they should not be very aggressive on the fibers, other the fibers are going to break or they might get damaged. <coughs> so, to avoid that, we should have widely spaced needles or teeth in the beginning. So, first few rows should have less number of teeth or unit length and as you go to the later part of the comb or lap, we will have more and more needles per unit length. So, front portion of the projected lap contain disoriented fibers and impurities, a gradual penetration of widely spaced needles avoids fiber damage and extract bigger impurities also. This is also to remember. Otherwise, sometimes what happens that if the gap between them is too narrow and some of the trash particles would get lost in between the needles and it would be difficult to remove them. So, it is better that first few rows should have widely spaced needles and later rows will have more needles per unit length. The finer needles extract finer impurities, which are still left in the lap. So, combing also in a way is clearing the fibers. 
The other machine element which is there on the machine is called top comb. Top comb, uh, let me show you a top comb which I, I can see you. This is what top comb is. So, top comb, you can see the needles here, only a single row of needles on the top comb. These needles that is which are here are soldered to the needle bar. So, they are all soldered here on this is needle bar, this red portion that you see here. And then the needle bar is screwed to the to another plate which we call the uh, and this whole thing is detachable. I can any time remove it very easily and also I can put it back on the machine. So, the top comb appears in between detaching rollers and the nippers. And why it is in between we will discuss it later on. Needles are soldered to the needle bar which is screwed to the holder. Top comb is mounted on lower nipper plate and it swings along with the plate top comb is fixed in position and is not lifted up and down. The penetration of the top comb into the comb fringe and spacing from detaching rollers are adjustable. These two things are important that the depth of penetration of the top comb into the comb cone fringe and the spacing from the detaching rollers are adjustable. So, how far they will be away from the detaching rollers? is also adjustable and how much they will penetrate the fringe can also be adjusted. These two parameters affect the combing efficiency, so they are adjustable. Now, next point is piecing mechanism by detaching rollers. So, there is another important you know, function that needs to be done that is detaching. We have uh, discussed earlier that the fringe that we create, cone fringe that we create that needs to be removed from the fringe from the lap. So, for piecing detaching roller must make backward and forward rotations to feed back part of the previously cone fringe. So, if you see it here, these rollers, both of them, there is a pair of detaching rollers are there. These are two bottom rollers and top rollers. The bottom rollers get their drive from some other source. We will discuss about the drive later on because that is a very complex drive. But let us try to understand how the detaching roller is going to work. These two are the rollers, they work together. First, for every cycle or for every each revolution of the cylinder shaft, we can say the detaching roller will move or rotate in the clockwise directions and also in the anti-clockwise directions. So, it has two types of rotations, a clockwise rotation and anti-clockwise rotations or we can say forward rotation or a backward rotations, whatever you want to say. Forward motions of the nippers make the tip part of the just comb fringe to fall on the feedback part of the previously comb fringe. So, this is the way the detaching actually happens and the piecing happens. So, for piecing what we do? We feed back the previously cone fringe which is still remain gripped in between the detaching roller. So, what we actually detached in the previous cycle it is still held in between the detaching rollers they are still held here and in each what we do we feed them back first by some amount and to do that they need to be rotated in the anti clockwise in the clockwise direction first. 
So, they will first rotate in the clockwise direction, part of the previously detached fringe will be fed back. Now, the fringe that we have combed in the present cycle, that fringe is actually moving towards the detaching roller nip because of the forward movement of the nipper assembly. And part of this fringe that we have just combed is going to fall on the fringe that has been fed back and therefore, there will be an overlapping that is what is required. So, there is overlap zone which will be there once this overlap has happened the detaching roller will turn in a anti clockwise direction now that is in the forward directions. So, forward rotation of the detaching roller must be greater than the backward rotations. If the clockwise and anti clockwise rotation remains exactly same, then the detached fringe will not move forward at all, it will remain where it is all the time. Therefore, what we need that the forward rotations should be little more than the backward rotations. So, as a result, there will be net forward movement of the fringe that we are creating and feeding in the detaching rollers. So, this kind of movement that is, so detaching roller movement if you try to understand, one is that it will rotate or turn in clockwise and anti clockwise directions, it has to change the direction of rotation. The second thing is the forward rotation has to be more than the backward rotations. So, how do we you know generate such kind of motions that we are going to learn later on, but for that what we need is a differential gear or epicyclic grad train which is required in the drive which gives such kind of motions that is forward backward and forward rotation is more than the backward rotations. That we will discuss in some other uh, class. The whatever I have told it is being shown in a in this diagram again. If you look at the diagram on the right hand side, to create such a kind of motion, what we do? An intermittent motion I is superimposed on a constant basic rotation k. What is being shown here in this diagram? So let us say as a constant rotation shown by this yellow rectangle, its value is k. And we generate another motion which is called intermittent motion which is represented by I. Intermittent rotation is faster than the basic rotations. So, the speeds are actually not same, they are different. When I and K are in the same sense that both are positive as shown in the diagram, the motions are added together, the detaching roller moves in the forward direction. So, what we see here, this is the zero line. So, when I and K are in the same directions, we get I plus K, we, we can move from here to there this much. That is in the forward direction, it moves by this distance. And when the sense of I changes, K remains same, then we get a net movement which is equivalent to B. When I and K are in the opposite sense, the intermittent rotation cancels the constant rotation and causes reverse rotations of the detaching roller as speed of intermittent rotation is higher than constant rotations. So, intermittent rotations speed is little higher than the constant that we generate in the system and, and therefore, when I is reversed, it cancels the value of k and it goes further and the net is b and b goes in the negative direction as shown in the diagram. So, therefore, if forward rotation is going to be k plus i 
and backward movement or backward rotation is going to be k minus i. So, if you plot this, it goes like this as shown in this diagram. Typically, backward movement is around 49 mm, forward movement is 81 mm and therefore, the net forward movement is 81 minus 49 that is 32 mm. That means, for every cycle, the overlap fringe will move forward by 32 millimeter that is 3.2 centimeter. That is how the piecing is going to happen and we generate this kind of motion in the detaching rollers. So, with this the part of the mechanism is almost over. The rest which is left is usually very simple, not very complex part. They are very, very straightforward and uh, like these drivers will be made to pass or the fringe that we create, the overlap fringe is made to pass through a trumpet for consolidation and then it takes the form of a sliver now. The sliver is moved forward over a table. So, there are guiding rollers and the slivers from eight heads will be collected together and they will enter a drafting system or a drafting zone where they will be all drafted together. So, drafting system you have already you know you already know probably you have studied earlier and uh, the movement of the sliver with the help of some rollers is also not very complex phenomena. So, the most complex phenomena which are there is basically the creation of the oscillating movement of the Nipper assembly, the rocking motion of the Nipper shaft and the motion that we create in the detaching rollers. These three are basically most complex ones and we have discussed this. So, with this I think the mechanism part is over, we will move on to the next uh, lesson. Thank you.